In this video, I'm going to be showing you how you can use YAML in your programs. So what is YAML? Well, YAML is a human readable serialization language that can be used for configuration and for data storage. YAML is an acronym for YAML ain't markup language. So it's a recursive acronym, which is quite fun. And some of the major benefits of using YAML is that it is simple, it is highly readable, and it also has a wide language support. So let's create our first YAML file. And I'm going to be doing this in PyCharm. So I'll hold Command plus N to create a new file, which I'm going to call config.yaml. And you can actually also specify it to be .yml if you prefer, but I'm going to keep it at YAML. Both of these extensions are going to lead us to a YAML file. And I will make this a bit smaller. So first of all, we're going to create a simple YAML file and we're also going to load it into our Python script. So to do that, first we're going to create, or we can actually add a comment to get started. We're going to call this web server configuration. So a web server is going to have some info of the version, which is going to be set to 1.0.0 because that's the first version. And we're going to have a website for this, which is called https example.com. So the first thing to note is that in YAML, we have indentation, which is represented by spaces, and that's how you create a block, just like in Python. And the second thing to notice is that now we have key value pairs, and that's how you create fields in YAML. But I'll be showing you what this looks like in a dictionary format very shortly, so you'll have a better idea on what it actually does. But then let's create a database, and the database is going to have a type and a path. So another thing to mention is that you do not need to specify quotation marks for what you're typing in here. It just helps you keep it a bit more explicit of what data type it is because YAML does infer the data type based on what input you put. So if you put 10, it's going to see that as an integer. Otherwise, if you add quotation marks around a variable, it's going to see it as a string, but these are going to be interpreted as strings. And finally, we're going to create some roots and inside here, we're going to create a list. And to do that, we're going to use a dash. So it's going to have a path, which will be API. And it's going to have these methods that are going to have get and post, which is a shorthand list. So now we have this list here and this list here that both leads to these parameters. So it's a very basic configuration file. And I'll explain more of this in just a moment. But let's load that into our script. So to load it, we actually need to install a package. So we're going to type in pip install py yaml. And with this package, we're going to be able to load it just like we would load JSON, for example. But once you have that installed, you can type in import yaml. That's going to be the package. It's not going to be called py yaml, but it's just going to be called yaml. And we're also going to import pretty print. So actually from pprint, we will import pprint. Then with open, and he will add config.yaml in read mode as file, we're going to say that the configuration, which is of type dictionary, is going to equal yaml.safeload. And we're going to load the file. Now with yaml, you have two options. You can either load it just as it is, or you can use safe load. And safe load is just supposed to be a way that protects you from malicious attacks from code or from YAML files that you've maybe downloaded from the internet. And just like with many recommendations, if you download something random from the internet, there's always a chance it can contain something malicious in there. And if you're familiar with the concept of pickling in Python, then you'll understand exactly what I mean. You don't want your program to execute arbitrary code. In case you don't know what pickling is, I will leave a link in the description box down below because I'm sure you'll probably find that interesting as well. But all you should know is that this provides a safe alternative to loading data from a YAML file, which might be malicious. But with that being loaded, we can now pretty print the configuration and we're going to set sort dictionaries to false because pretty print does like to organize them alphabetically and I don't want that. I want them to print exactly in the order that we mentioned in our YAML file. But once you have all of that and you run the program, you'll notice you're going to get this kind of dictionary back with the data that we've provided. So let's go back to our configuration file to analyze this. So first we created a block with info. So as you can see, info is going to be the key and what's inside it is going to be a block, which is another dictionary with the version number 
and the website. We did the exact same thing with the database. And as you can see, they were interpreted as strings. So we got a database key with a database dictionary inside with the type and the path. Then for the roots, we managed to create a list. So roots was the key. And by adding a dash, we created a list with these dictionaries inside. So that gave us a path with this and some methods and another path with admin and some other methods. So now we can use this configuration however we like, just like with Tommel or with JSON, all we have to do is make a simple change inside here, such as version 1.0.1, .1, and it's going to reflect across our entire program. So that's very nice, it's very simple, and it's very efficient. So with that being said, we've got a basic idea on what YAML looks like. Now it's time I actually explain the data types that you can use with YAML so you have a better understanding on what you can specify and what you can't. So here we'll just type in a comment of data types and we'll get started with a string value. So a string value can have quotation marks or it can choose not to have quotation marks, but if it is text, it's going to be interpreted as a string. So here we'll say hello world, for example, and that's going to guarantee that that's going to be a string because if you don't write that and you just say hello, it's still going to be interpreted as a string, but if for some reason you change this to a number later, you'll notice that it's not going to be a string any longer. It's now being interpreted as an integer. So next you can choose to have an int, which is just any whole number, or a float, which is just a decimal number, such as 3.14. And if you run these, they will actually end up being either a float or an integer. And then you have booleans, and booleans in YAML are actually really fun because there's different ways you can actually specify a boolean. One way is to use true and false. So if you say true, it will give us true. And if you say false, it's going to give us false. So that's quite simple. But something super cool about this is that you can also say yes or no. And it's going to pass that into the boolean format that your language uses. So in Python, we have uppercase true and uppercase false. So you can say yes or no, you can say off or on. And all of these are going to give us either true or false. So I just found that quite cute in YAML that you can use these kind of keywords to specify a Boolean. But we'll just set that to false. And finally, we have a null value. So if we type in null, we can specify it to be null. And that means we're going to get none back in Python. And maybe I should have changed this to something else such as null val. So now we have a key of null value with a none type. And you can also specify that by keeping this empty or by using this tilde. It's going to consider it a none value. So these were the primitive data types or the scalars that we could use with YAML. Now there are some more complex data types such as dictionaries or mappings. And to create a mapping, you can just type in mapping or any kind of title you want. And then you provide a key and a value pair, just like you would with normal JSON. So here we get a mapping with the dictionary inside. Then if you want a list, you just type in list and you can either make it shorthand as this over here and it will provide a list for us or you can make it look more like a cooking recipe and you can say item one, item two and item three and it will give you the same result except in this nicer format. Next we have nested mappings. So we can type in nested mapping and to create a nested mapping, you just add a key and then you add a key inside that key. So we're now starting to create this hierarchy of values inside values. So we've got the key with the key value pair inside that key. And you can add as many as you want. So if you run this, you'll see that the nested mapping is going to have a dictionary of two other mappings to go a level deeper. And you can do the same thing with the lists. So if we type in nested list, you'll see that we can add a list item. And then inside that list item, we can add some more list items or some elements. And if we run that, we will get a list of these list items inside the nested list. And finally, if you want, you can even mix these two. You can say, for example, that you have a sub list or a sub key. So we'll say sub key. And inside this sub key, will have these elements. So now we're mixing the syntax of both the mappings and the list. So if we run that, you'll see that we're going to have a lot of nesting being done inside our nested list. 
So that's the basic concept on how you can use the data types and the valid data types. But there are some superpowers that come with YAML that I also want to show you when you are using YAML. And actually, I'm just going to call these features. I think that word is much more adapt. So here we'll type in features. So the first feature is quite simple. We have a sample that contains an item. And all I'm going to demonstrate here is that you can use comments. They can either be inline or they can be outside. So that's up to you. You create a comment by adding a hash symbol, just like in Python. And when you run this, the comment will be ignored, but you'll still have that sample item key pair being executed in the YAML. Next, let's pretend you have some text. So we'll call this text. And maybe you want to have a multi-line string of text. So we're just going to type in, this is a short story about an apple. So if we indent that and we run the script, you'll see that it's going to be passed to a single line. It's going to remove the new lines and it's going to leave it in one line. So if you want to get around that, you're going to have to add a pipeline. And we're going to have to put this under. So the pipeline is just telling the program that everything under here should be treated as it is. So it's going to create the new lines for us. As you can see, now it has the new line in every line break, which means if we actually try to print that text, so if we go back here and we say print, and we get the config, and we print it at the index of text, you'll see it's going to print to the console just as we wrote it in the YAML file. Then we have something called a folded string. So if we add this right arrow, we can now convert this text to a folded string, which means it's going to remove the single new lines and it's going to change double new lines to single new lines. And that's actually really confusing. I had to ask ChatGPT what the hell it was talking about. And what it came to was that if you have two new lines, this will be reverted to a single new line while this will be concatenated together. So for example, if we run this, you'll see that this is a short story because here we have one new line. So one new line was removed and converted into a single line, while two new lines were converted into a single line. So as you can see down here, we have this is a short story with only one new line. If this was a pipeline, we would have two new lines here and one new line where it says this is. So luckily ChatGPT did help me out with understanding that silly difference. And now you know as well what it does. Next, we're going to be looking at anchors and aliases. So what is an anchor and what is an alias? Well, the best way to explain that is to create an example. So here we have a key of item and we're actually going to turn this into an anchor. So we'll just say that this is an item anchor. And then we're going to give it the value. So we can give it a value of let's say one, two and three. So it's a shorthand list of one, two, three. Now, next time we create something such as, let's say, um, tool, we can give this tool a name such as hammer. And now we can also specify an item and we can now refer to the item anchor. So it's kind of like creating a variable. We now created an item anchor that links to these values here. And before we run this, we need to remove the configuration test. But when we do run this, you'll see that item has these values and now the tool of hammer also has an item with the same values that refer to the original item, which means if we change something in the item anchor, such as 10, it's going to update it also in the item of the tool. So this is what they define to be an anchor, and this is the alias, or in other words, it's a variable. But you can do some things that are even cooler than that. You can type in person, and we can say this person has a person anchor, so person anchor, and you don't have to type in anchor, you can write something else if you want. But if we continue this and we fill out the information, we have John Doe, who's 30 and is a developer. We now created an anchor of John Doe, which means if we want to create another person that follows his example, we can do that first by adding two left arrows, which creates a mapping or it creates a merging of mappings. So with that, we can type in person anchor. So now it's going to put all of these values from John Doe or from that person into this other person. And we can also override those values. So maybe instead of John Doe, we have Apple Bob, who's going to also be 30 and a developer. So just like that, we can reuse these values 
without having to rewrite that code. So now we have person of John Doe, blah, blah, blah. And we have another person of Apple Bob who has the same values as John Doe, with the exception of the values that we changed. So it's kind of like creating a class of that person. It has some given attributes, and this just fills it out for the next person that we use it with. And the final feature I'm going to show you are the compact mappings and the compact lists, but those are quite self-explanatory. So for example, we have a compact map, which is going to be of type dictionary, or as you can see, we just insert a dictionary and that creates a compact mapping. And the same thing goes for the list. So if you want to have a compact list, you can do that just by inserting a list just like that. And that might be just a bit cleaner depending on what you're doing instead of typing in list and adding each item one by one using the dash. So depending on what you're doing, you might choose one over the other but the result is going to be the same for both of these. And to conclude this video, I'm going to show you a simple example of where you could use YAML in a real life project. So in this example, we have a folder called translations and inside translations, I have English translations with info, greetings and messages. And I also have a Spanish translation. And I didn't check if these are correct translations or not. I used ChatGPT to generate these translations because it's fast and simple. But here we now have two files that we can use for our sample script. So I'm going to import YAML. I'm going to ask the user to select a language and it's going to ask them in English. So that can be changed depending on your current locale if you want to add that into your functionality. But as soon as we pick a language, it's going to load the given YAML file and it's going to add or print those messages to the console. So if we run this program and we say EN, it's going to give us the English messages. But maybe we're loading this program in Spain or some other Latin country and we say ES, now it's going to give us the Spanish translation. So that was a very simple way to use YAML, but there are plenty of other use cases. So it's very important you understand the syntax. And while this video won't give you a full tutorial on where to use it, in a professional context, it should have given you the basic understanding on how you can get started with using it, reading it, and just creating it for yourself. But that just about covers everything I wanted to go over regarding YAML. Do let me know in the comment section what you think about it and whether you would like to know something else about it. But otherwise, with all that being said, as always, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.